Good morning and welcome to the 16th meeting in 2018 of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone to turn mobile phones and other devices to silent so they don't disrupt the meeting or the broadcasting. We haven't any apologies um, for today's meeting, however, my colleague Ben McPherson will have to leave um, for a short period of time to attend another committee during proceedings. Uh, if we can turn to the agenda, uh, agenda one is a decision to take items in private and can the committee agree that agenda item five, consideration of the evidence today, six, seven and eight, which are the papers from the clerks, are all taken in private. Thank you very much. And agenda item two is um, uh, evidence session on funeral expense assistance regulations. Uh, Scottish Government is consulting on the draft regulations for funeral expense assistance and the committee is holding evidence session um, to feed into the consultation which closes on the 23rd of August. And I'd like to welcome to committee this morning our first panel. It's John Birrell, a bereavement consultant, John Birrell Consultancy. Paul Cuthill, the National Association of Funeral Directors, and Paul Stevenson, the Scottish President of the National Society of Allied and Independent Funeral Directors. And you're all very welcome to committee this morning. And if I could maybe just um, open the conversation today by asking just, just a little bit about the increased flexibility that appears to be in uh, the new regulations and whether you think that this there needs to be additional flexibilities in terms of people who may become eligible during um, the, who aren't eligible at the time of a death or an application but may well become eligible before a funeral takes place and whether that, that should be extended and um, If, if also, um, if the, the Scottish Government developing its policy um, consider that the minimum, a minimum evidence should be required to be given at the time of application, obviously it's a difficult time for people, and whether the, the, the burden on people to produce that evidence at time of application is appropriate. Um, and I'm looking to um, say, Mr Birrell, would you like to come in first on that one? I, th I think the Scottish Government has gone a long way to extend what we have known in the past from the DWP's benefit, and we welcome those extensions, um, particularly the, among them the extension of the, of the time scale um, to make applications. It is of quite possible that somebody may be in the process of applying for benefits when they experience a, a bereavement, <coughs> and that bereavement could set them back in doing other things because the, their focus is then on the grief. So. Although the six-month window is welcome, I can foresee that there may be times when people's circumstances change within those six months and just quite how flexible the new social security system will be to respond to that um, is something that we're, we're still talking about, I think. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cook? Yes, thank you. Um, I would agree with, with what John says. The, the system um, does seem to have an increased flexibility. Um, certainly, ultimately, what we must remember in this is that we are looking after the bereaved here, and it's the bereaved who will be affected, and anything which you know assists them in any way at all is, is certainly advantageous. Thank you. Mr Stevenson? I would concur. Uh, I, and as that people's circumstances have changed because of the bereavement, and then they might then be entitled to uh, DWP or any support. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring my colleagues in, uh, Mr. Balfour. Um, good morning, um, and thank you all for coming. Um, I wonder if I can just I explore a couple of areas. Um, in regard to the issue of... Um, the £700. Uh, I'm presuming that doesn't cover the whole of a funeral expense for a family. And I'm wondering if you can maybe help us work out, uh, try to do, do my words carefully, what, what is the bare minimum you can offer in regard to a family who come and say, you know, my granny's died, we, 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 we've got the £700. How much extra do you charge beyond that for a family? And how does that work? Maybe Paul can start with that one. 
Yes, I'm, I'm happy Oh, to. I will post. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ha happy to begin with, with that, um, Jeremy. Thank you. Um, I think we have to start by remembering that the £700 has remained static since 2003. And if I can just go back a little further than that, in the mid-1990s, the amount paid by the Social Fund and funeral expenses was around £95 million. If you look at the amount that was paid in 2015, 20 years later, it was £43 million. That's a drop of 50% in 20 years. And the criteria for claiming has, has apparently not changed in that time. Funerals have changed drastically in that time. I have worked in our family business now for 20 years. And when I first started in our business, you could routinely expect someone to pass away this morning and you would carry out their funeral on Saturday. And if not, it would be this coming Monday. The reality is though that someone dying this morning, they probably won't get the medical certificate of cause of death until later today. They'll then have to phone the registrar to make an appointment. They may get an appointment tomorrow, but realistically, it's probably going to be Monday. We'll, we'll meet with that family today, but that's automatically adding in another three or four days. So the reality is that that funeral is going to take place towards the end of next week. Funeral directors now have a far greater involvement. Deceased people are within our care for far longer. There's far more interaction with a family in that time period as well. People now stay further afield than they once did, waiting on people to return for funerals. There's um, increased pressure on local authorities. We're finding, you know, particularly in the early part of this year, where there was a very high volume of deaths, um, it was frequently for, for three months my local crematoria was, was taking two weeks before we could get a time slot with them. Cemeteries weren't just as bad, but there was still there was still the delay. So I mean to answer the question, how little can a funeral director um, do for a family? That's not always within our control. Um, families come to us with a great burden upon them. They're in, they're in a time where they need to be loved and to be cared for and to be guided. And um, whilst we would try to work with them to keep a funeral within their means, very often they're trying to have a funeral which is in expectations with what society has, has come to know. Um, faith plays a large part in that as well. The Roman Catholic community, it would be very common that the deceased would be brought to rest in church the evening before the funeral. Then there'd be the funeral mass the following day. And, you know, all of these things have an additional involvement on our part. We can't say to a family, oh, I'm sorry, we're, we're not able to allow our staff and our hearse to be available the evening before because there's an additional cost for that. Um, there's the Jewish culture where, you know, funerals must take place in a very quick period of, of time, you know, so that's going to the other end of the spectrum. But it's, it's, it's very difficult for us as funeral directors, you know, to say to people, well, this is the minimum that we can do and I'm afraid we can't do any more for you. I suppose what I'm looking for and, and is, I, I'm, I'm not saying that we go always down this road, but if, if you were looking at a figure which was realistic to cover your costs um, and was neutral, so you didn't make any money, but it was neutral, what kind of money are we then looking at for that? And I appreciate that, that, that will vary across Scotland, but can you give us some kind of indication? very sensitive for you to answer this well, question. I, well, I, I mean, I, I think, for um, example, Mr you, Stevenson has it on his website, so I, I, uh, yeah. you know, I, I did look last night to check to see. Uh, so I think it's, I, I mean, I'm not looking for great commercial confidentiality, but I, as an industry, you know, what roughly are we looking at? I would suggest a figure of £1,500. I mean, the £700, pound, you know, since 2003, fixed, and everybody knows this, uh, but the third party costs have gone up incredibly since then. Uh, even my own local authority at North Ayrshire Council in the last three years, I mean, the purchase of a, a new layer in 2015 was £519. Today it's 744 up 30%. A, a cremated remains layer, this small hole, purchased in 2015. £201. Today, £408. An increase of 103%. We don't want that side capped either, because it would increase the gap that the families would have to find for. We just want a fair figure for the family. And, and £700 
wasn't enough in 2003 either. So we're looking to that to a reasonable fair price. And now I can speak for myself, not commercially sensitive information, but our simple funeral price guide since 2015, it hasn't changed, uh, is £1,560 plus the disbursements. And even if you take the Bank of England's calculator, they bring it up to just over a thousand, nearly eleven hundred pound. Uh, but that's at, at two thousand three price, which wasn't enough then. So the calculation we make it then to about fifteen hundred pound. A couple of supplementaries, um, Ms. McCoy. I definitely yeah, sure. I'll bring in Ms. McNeil. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you're able to give the committee any information about repayment plans. I was thinking, so if a family gets awarded seven hundred pounds and that's not going to be enough. Um, do, are they offered a repayment plan for the rest? And if so, could you give us any guidance about um, what percentage or what numbers of families do that? I, I don't have a credit licence. Right. Do, do, do some funeral directors have? A I believe so. Yeah, but yeah. I believe some of our members would do so. I mean, certainly within my own business, if people don't have the means to, to pay a funeral, we would always say to them, well, you've, you've trusted us to look after you and we would trust that you'll come and pay us when you're in a position to do so. And we would ask a family to set up a standing order and to pay that over a period which, which we, would, we would speak with them about. Um, we don't charge them interest for doing so. But you don't need a credit licence for that? I don't need a credit licence. It's still informal. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, certainly. Just developing that area, in funeral directors which have perhaps a higher rate of uh, poverty within the area, from your members, are you hearing any members saying, we simply cannot afford to do these funerals because we can't, you know, uh, uh, we're not either getting the money back or um, it's costing us too much? And is there any danger that there will be parts of a country where funeral, it will be more difficult to find someone to do a funeral for you? Or can your members, are they coping with that at the moment, if that makes sense? The, the fear is a bad debt. I, and if you're in a, a poverty area, there's obviously a lot more of these funerals coming to you. So it's, it's communication, it's, 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 it's chat with the family. I, but there are on occasions where that there is no money above the seven hundred pound at all. It's, it's, it's impossible to do the funeral. The, I think the, the difficulty that we have as trying to run commercial businesses is that people come to us and they don't have the money and they ask us to look after a funeral service for them. But the cemetery, the crematorium authority, who we we'll, liaise with on behalf of the family, they'll require to be paid immediately upon their, their invoice, as will the florist, as would the newspaper, as would the organist on the day of the funeral, or the, the fees for the church if these apply, or the celebrant that's taking the funeral, or, 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 or these kind of things. And I think that that's where it, it's difficult for funeral directors, and you'll find the vast majority would now ask for any third party costs to be paid in advance of the funeral. Um, because the funeral director simply doesn't know if the, the, the family are going to receive assistance towards the cost of the funeral until after the funeral. The, the DWP will not make a decision on the current system unless they have the final invoice from the funeral director. And certainly our members, we, we have within our code of practice that the client has the right to change the funeral arrangements at any time at all. Therefore, our members would be in breach of our code of practice if they were to issue an invoice in advance of the funeral. What we do tell them is that they, they must give the client an estimated cost of the funeral at the time of discussing the funeral arrangements, which will then be followed up by a full written estimate as far as practically possible. And you know that will very much accurately record the funeral director's costs based on the instructions that are given. And these, these seldom change after that. Occasionally a, a limousine may be added or taken off or something like that. But the, the, the costs that aren't known before the funeral will often be things such as the florist's invoice or the, the cost for the catering, perhaps. You know, these, these costs can be estimated to a degree, but the, the challenge is that the decision is not made whether assistance will be given until after the funeral. Yeah, Mr. Biddle. Um, and, and therein lies a really major issue because um, although we, I think, all welcome the government's undertaking to try and process <coughs> these applications within 10 days, 
Nevertheless, the bereaved family are signing a contract with the funeral director, possibly for a, a, sm a small amount as they can arrange, or possibly more than they can afford because they assume they're getting, going to get the benefit. But they're committing themselves financially before they know whether they're going to be eligible um, for the, the funeral payment or not. Um, funeral directors do their best to give them advice, but they're not financial advisors, and there's a limit to how much they can ask about the family's own finances. Um, but the family then take a gamble that they will sign the contract, and they'll commit themselves to this bill of, with including the, um, the, the disbursements, we're talking of the average funeral costing about three and a half thousand pounds. Um, but even if they're coming in under the benefit and therefore the, the disbursements are paid, they're still committing themselves to this 1,500 pound minimum standard charge of a, a basic funeral. And they don't know whether they're even going to get the 700 towards that or not. Can I ask just briefly, is, is the first conversation with a family you about the possibility of funeral expenses um, being, being paid with the funeral director or do are people aware of, of it being a possibility when they approach you? Things have changed over the years I, and it is an important conversation now to have. How is the funeral going to be paid? And now that might be from an estate, might be from insurance, it might be the DWP. I, in my experience, most people who, who are on benefits are well aware of what they're going to get or not. I, so they're able to come up with a figure. And the £700 for all the, the funeral arrangements side from the funeral director I, is, is certainly not enough. Even if the family go and pay for their own floral tribute, they go and pay for their own tea, they pay for the newspaper themselves, the £700 is still not near enough for all the funeral director's arrangements, the hair, the call from the professional trained staff, etc. And um, Michelle, you wanted in, was a supplementary in this area? Yes, it, it was just to explore a comment that um, I think it, good morning, Jen, um, was in Paul's evidence um, where you talked about reduce the number of refusals on unexpected debt by bereaved people. Um, and you, you, you said that you, you felt some sort of screening need to put in place. But I'm assuming people are coming to you potentially within a couple of days of, of the person um, dying. And when you say refusal, are you talking about you saying, no, sorry, we won't, we won't take this funeral on the basis that we don't think you can pay? And is that on what they're saying to you? or? Say it's on the basis that we don't think the client can pay it. I think it would, it would be on the basis that the client has said that they are not able to pay the the funeral invoice when we've had the discussion with them. Now, I, we, we need to understand that the initial conversation with a bereaved family could be at three o'clock in the morning when that person's died in the family home. Now, when I answer the phone at three o'clock in the morning, the first thing I'm going to say to them is, how are you going to pay for the funeral? It, it, can you give me your credit card details, please? It's just not appropriate to do that. They, they have someone who's died who may be lying on the bathroom floor and they, they need someone to look after them. And unfortunately, they can't get in touch with any other people that would, would assist them. So that, that would be the first point. But thereafter, we would certainly be discussing the funeral arrangements with the family. And of course, as our members should, we would discuss the, the cost of the funeral um, with the client. But it's, it's, it's not in anyone's interest any business whatsoever to take on uh, a debt um, or to, to, to take on business which they know they're not going to be paid for is, is what I'm trying to say. Um, so that, that may be an instance where the funeral director feels they're not able to look after a family and that's purely because the family are unsure if they'll get assistance. They don't have the money to pay the additional third party costs which we are paying on, on their behalf at the outset. So therefore the question is, well, how, how would they intend to pay the rest of the, the funeral service? But that refusal can come after you've collected the body and the body is on your premises? It may, it may come after we have collected the deceased. And then, then what happens? At that point in time, the, the funeral director certainly wouldn't turn their back upon the family. I mean, within my own business, we would look upon that situation very sympathetically. And I know that many, many of our members would do so as well. And if we weren't aware of that at that point in time, nor were the bereaved family, I suspect the funeral director wouldn't make a charge for the services they had provided thus far because they had done what was essential at that time 
to get the family to the point where they now they now were. It's very different if the funeral director's been engaged fully by the client and there's been a contractual agreement written into and the costs have been discussed and then the client turns around and says, no, I'm sorry, I'm not able to do this. And by that time, the funeral director may have confirmed the times with the clergy, with the cemetery, with the, the newspaper, you know, the, the, all the different people that will be involved. There's a, a fair amount of work has taken place. Yeah, uh, what I'm curious about, or uh, what I'm trying to get to, I suppose, is if somebody comes in, y you have assessed and you don't think they're going to pay, that may or may not be because they've got an application for support through the DWP or what will be the Scottish Social Security system. The deceased is, is in your care. The person is saying, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay. You're not confident. So then what happens? Uh, and, and how many people are we talking about? What, what situation are we actually looking at? Here? It is a very difficult situation. And at the end of the day, we are a business, but it's, it's a unique business in many ways. Mm. I, and, and to make these judgment calls and assessments is very difficult. But if you have a family who, who then go to the bank and, and ask for a bank loan and are refused the bank loan to pay for the funeral, and then the family are asking us to pay it up it's the same thing. I'm not criticising whether or not you can do it. I'm, no. I'm asking what actually happens. Because th these are people potentially who are coming along. And I suppose for us, as, as we're looking at this, and we're looking at what are the issues around um, assistance being granted or the right amount of assistance being mm. granted, what are the, the problems that it can encounter? And this leapt out at me, the, the word you know refusal. Um, I understand commercially why you might have to do that what I'm asking is what what do the family then do what happens to the deceased you know and what time frame are we talking about take a part of a community if, if, if Paul says hey, someone dies at three o'clock in the morning we're not having that conversation we bring the person into our care mm -hmm. and then the conversations would take place thereafter I what happens then I, I, if, if, if we turn down the funeral, mm -hmm. we're not going to charge for bringing somebody into the care at that stage. Mm -hmm. I, the, the family would then be free to select another funeral director uh, who, who's, who's, who's willing to take the hit, I, I suppose. Think, I, I think as funeral directors, though, we would, be, we would be making the client aware that they should perhaps be speaking to the DWP mm -hmm. at the outset to, to understand whether they may be able to... Um, have assistance because clearly if they don't have the, the means to pay a deposit for a funeral service then clearly they, they are in financial hardship so we would be encouraging them to do that, we would be encouraging them to speak to other organisations who may be able to, to offer support, there are charities, you know, if people are former service personnel etc we would be encouraging them to, to do that. We would be discussing with them how to try and keep a funeral within their means, you know, what Paul was, was talking, you were asking about the, the bare minimum and, you know, what, what is funeral directors we would class as a, a basic funeral and in that you find the vast majority of funeral directors will, will offer a basic funeral or a simple funeral package but that would very often be the minimal involvement upon the funeral director's part. It would be the essential care of the deceased. It wouldn't allow for the provision of having a service prior to the burial or the cremation. It wouldn't allow for limousines. It wouldn't allow for family coming to pay their respects. It wouldn't allow for the... I mean, previously would term a pauper's funeral, I think was Perhaps, this, perhaps, the, the, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, but then ultimately, if it becomes apparent at that point in time that it's just not possible for for that family to, to have the finances available, then we would suggest that they would be discussing things then with the local authority who may provide an, an envir what we would call traditionally a pauper's funeral, environmental health funeral. Um, and it's, it would be their duty then to undertake the funeral service, but the, that would be an instance where there is no family at all. It's clear that no one is able to look after the funeral service. I just have one final. What is the time like? Because time seems to be the key in this process. How long have people got? You know, what turnaround do we need in a system to ensure that this kind of difficulty doesn't doesn't occur? I think in the system we we would we would need a decision made in principle before the funeral. That, that would help the bereaved. It would help the funeral director to know exactly where they stand at the moment. That, that doesn't happen, unfortunately. And the reality is that there is a deceased person, there is a bereaved family, there is a community 
one thing to know. The first thing that people will ask when they hear that someone has died is when is the funeral going to take place? And by that time, their family already will be you know, getting the death certificate from the hospital or the GP. They'll be making an appointment to go to the registrar. And the next thing they're going to do is they're going to be speaking with the funeral director. They're going to be speaking with the DWP. You know, when people come to us, they often say, we've already been in touch with the DWP. We've got the documents, but they say they need your invoice. We say, well, unfortunately, we, we can't issue an invoice until the funeral takes place. We can give you a full type testament of the funeral service, but ultimately we cannot issue an invoice until we've provided you with that full service. So it's a process problem. Thank you. Okay, Mr Griffin, did you want to come in on that issue um, with regards to where there's no family? Yep, uh, yep. Uh, before I go on to um, funeral expenses assistance, just to ask if you're able to outline what happens um, when someone dies and they have no family members. Okay, so in, in an instance where someone dies, they have no family members, there are a number of scenarios. It may be that that person has made provision with a funeral plan or they may have made provision within a will and have a, a solicitor named as their executor. There may be instances where there is a neighbour or a very close friend that would look after that funeral and there's, or that neighbour or close friend may end up paying for that funeral along with some of the deceased's own funds or ultimately if there is absolutely no one that would be where the local authority would then step in and would then take ownership of arranging that funeral service. And so in that situation where a, a close friend or, or a neighbour took responsibility, um, would they qualify for any assistance through the funeral expenses assistance as we see it now if they met the qualifying criteria when they weren't a, a direct family relative? I'm sorry, I'm unsure of that. I wouldn't be confident in answering that either way. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying I believe it won't happen. I just, I just don't have it clear enough in my own mind. Yeah, I, I think they would have to meet the criteria. Yeah. Uh, whatever that criteria is, and if it's a neighbour, does a neighbour meet that criteria? Does a close friend meet that criteria? And I, I don't know the answer to that just now. The the reason for re for raising it is that uh, I had spoken to a, a social worker over the weekend, and we were talking about this situation where. Um, he had a client who had died and, and there was no funds available to, to pay for a funeral and he was he was doing this off his own back because he had gotten close to his client in arranging the, the funeral and just think about the situation where someone like that or a neighbour or a close friend was taking on the responsibility, whether we should be looking at making sure that they have the kind of assistance available that, that a family member would have if they were um, in receipt of one of the qualifying benefits. I don't know what your view would be on that. Yeah, I agree. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms Johnson, did you want to come in on this area? Or yeah, I, I, yep, think, I, think, I think it's the, the same area. Um, the written ev evidence suggests that many crematoria and cemeteries don't accept bodies without a coffin. Um, is, is that correct? And am I correct in thinking as well that coffin, that, that those charges would not come under essential costs? In reality, <laughs> I mean, reality, you don't need a funeral director. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in reality, a, a local authority or a crematorium is not going to accept a body uh, without a coffin. Yeah, the, the only instance where uh a funeral, a burial, I should say, would take place would be for cultural belief, um, beliefs, and you know that maybe that perhaps the the Muslim community there would be areas where the deceased would be taken to the burial place, but then removed from their coffin. I'm within my area, and um, that's not the case. Um, there is a Muslim area within the cemetery, and that, that's not the case. But certainly other faith groups would be able to offer that. But certainly, I, I agree with Paul that um, a, a deceased person will not be accepted with a, at the crematorium if they are not within a coffin of whatever structure that coffin may be. And what would be the minimal cost for a coffin? What, you know, how, how inexpensive could that be? I mean, it's just it, citizens' advice are suggesting to us here that the average cost of a funeral is some £3,598. Um, you're suggesting that um, £1,500 could deliver the essentials. I mean, ca can... Can £1,500 deliver the dignity that we would all want to, to see? 
the figure quoted there uh, in my local authority if uh, it was a new layer, an open new layer, that's £1,500 off straight away. So all of a sudden, my average is down to 2300 And we have a paper notice, which is maybe not essential. Floral tribute, mm -hmm. £100, maybe not essential. So start taking these things off. Uh, and if it's direct to the crematorium or the cemetery, you don't have any church fees, etc. So this is where the figure starts coming down and down. And I could be on average of £1,500 then, mm -hmm. on the funeral director's side only. Mm -hmm. If I may, I, um, I submitted in my evidence the suggestion that <coughs> a coffin, in fact, is an essential, um, where really the funeral director, although I think they're hugely important, is not essential. You can go ahead without one, but my suggestion was that the cost of the <coughs> coffin should be moved over into the, um, the first part of the payment, uh, where we're now covering the cost of the funeral, the, the burial and cremation, and also basic transport. And I believe that the cost of the coffin should sit within <laughs> that part of the benefit and not have to come off the 700 pounds for the, exactly this reason, that you cannot really arrange a funeral without a coffin. It is an essential. Can I ask another question, Convener? Yes. Um, there's obviously the, the death registration process is taking longer. Um, the evidence speaks of the land deficit. Um, the fact that more private companies are moving into the cremation um, side of things and that it's an increasingly commercialised market. Um, you, there's also evidence suggesting that some local authorities are using floating squads. Um, you know, all of these things seem to suggest that, that everything will take longer. And I'd just like to understand the difference that time makes to the cost. You know, is the fact that things are taking longer, is, is that making things more expensive? Um, I, I would say yes, it, it does have a cost implication. Um, I'd said earlier on that there's a lot more interaction with the, the client, a lot more involvement on the funeral director's part. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as a business now, we have our own fully qualified embalmer, which we didn't within the business 20 mm -hmm. years ago because there just wasn't a need for, for that service. The reality is that because deceased people are with us for far longer, we want to ensure that they're cared for to the highest possible standard. There can often be the need for us to have a conversation with the client to seek their permission to, to carry out embalming to ensure that everything remains as it should between the time of the death and the time of the funeral, just to to come back to the, the cost of the, the coffin, we've also noticed a, a marked increase in the levels of obesity, meaning that larger coffins are often having to be provided. The result is far more staff being required, um, more equipment needing to be invested in, in order to ensure that we are looking after the welfare of our staff, that the deceased is being transported in a dignified manner. So all of these things have, have a cost implication as well. Mm -hmm. And finally, I understand that the DWP previously had bereavement officers um, and they no longer do and that you've had to, t to fill that gap too. Online and telephone. So we, we, we have the conversation with the families, assist them to fill in things. Very difficult over the phone when they've just had a bereavement and uh, they want to know if there's monies available to them mm -hmm. uh, before they even maybe approach the funeral director. And, and just to add to Paul's comments as well, uh, we have installed more refrigerated units in our business because the length of time from the time of death to the time of registration, which we can only embalm after that, uh, is longer as well. So we've got these refrigerated units 24-7 running as well, so there's all sorts of costs and patients. Oh, OK, thank you very much. Um, Panel, um, I want to ask you about um, the relationships to the deceased of people, people applying. One of the strongest criticisms of the system at the moment is that questions can be intrusive when the DWP are trying to establish um, the the connection to the fa to the family. Um, I wonder, do you think if the new Scottish proposals, which um, are going to introduce a family hierarchy of relationships might help avoid some of that intrusive questions questioning and I guess it's always um, if we're talking about 
death and money, two topics that are always going to potentially feel uncomfortable and a bit intrusive, but do you think that some of the changes might help address some of that? I, I think they would certainly help. I think that we would welcome um, anything which makes the process easier for the bereaved. At, at present, um, the DWP will look into other family members who, I should add, may have had no contact with the disease for a considerable period of time, who the person who is our client may not have had any contact with. You know, that our client may be the, the sole carer for the deceased, but there could be another four siblings who actually have been estranged from that family for a, a period of time. And that, that can certainly be very distressing for a client going through the process, having to outline, having to get in touch with people that perhaps they haven't been in communication with for many years. Emotions are running very high and they're always heightened at the time of a funeral. And very often we're the people that are in the middle with, with conflicting um, situations. I think the proposal in the draft regulations actually goes further than, further than that because they're also saying that where there are people on the same level in the hierarchy and somebody else on the same level might actually have the money to pay for the funeral, if that's not the person who has stepped forward to arrange the funeral, they won't chase even across the same level in the hierarchy. And that is hugely generous, I think, on behalf of the government, and I welcome that because the DWP do have the reputation for, um, at times, almost trying to find somebody that they can land it on so they don't have to pay, so they're constantly trying to hold back on payments. Um, and the Scottish system is, is taking a much more sensitive and a much more generous approach than that. And do you think that that discretion um, that's going to be afforded to ministers, um, that the level of that, is it the, the right level? It sounds like you did from your first response, but yeah, I don't know. What level are you talking about? Monetary level? Uh, no, just in terms of the, the like we're speaking about the, the hierarchy right. of relationships. If, 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 it was, if it was really quite transparent and simple, again, we as the funeral director can help the family in, in the decision process. But again, we're taking the risk in doing it anyway. Okay, thank you. Can, can I just ask? As you mentioned, that some people will have a will and an executor appointed as a solicitor. Um, can, can people make these choices before death about who they want to be responsible and, and, and what what um, influence would that have in law and in terms of the DWP? If, say, somebody said they wanted a particular um, son or daughter to do it and another person was perhaps eligible to get the assistance um, are you aware of what, what implications those might be? The executor would have a, a sole autonomy in the situation. Because so, so the could executor doesn't need to be a family member. Right. It could be a friend, it could be the, uh, uh, the solicitor themselves. But they would have full autonomy to deal with the estate. And they could actually change a sort of written re request from a deceased person if they... Yep. If, if it's because it is a request. The, yeah. Someone someone may request to be cremated, mm. but in the circumstance of death, a uh, procurator fiscal might say the funeral can go ahead, but it can only be a burial, because a body could be disinterred at a later stage, mm -hmm. where after cremation there's no redress. So it is a, it is a wish. Okay. Thank you. Um, the, so, so the figure you've given the committee of, of the of basic funeral, £1,500, would it be possible at some point to get a breakdown of what that looks like so that the committee could see where... where you know, what arrangements are made for yeah, that? So it's a basic funeral, so you're talking about some pure transport costs. Right, it, it, making all the, 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 the funeral arrangements, providing professional advice uh, on the certification registration of the death, uh, and any related documentation to crematorium local authority. Removal of the deceased to a suitable resting place and under our code of practice we say within 25 miles radius. In practice that doesn't happen if it's fuller, we still do it for the, the same price. Uh, and within normal working hours, again, I, we're 24-7, somebody dies on a Friday night, three o'clock in the morning, you know, we bring into our care. Provision of simple veneered coffin, the conveyance of the, the hearse direct to the crematorium, 
uh, or burial, place of burial. We also, in that, that code of practice, we say without the choice of the day, date and time of the funeral, but again, as funeral directors, we're very flexible in that as well. Uh, and provide all the, the funeral director and all the necessary personnel to carry out all the works. Thank you. Um, so we've, we've established that in the cases of um, where the body is to be cremated, so the, the, the crematorium will not accept a body without a coffin. Um, but also that there's no requirement for a funeral director. Um, have you heard of... Is it possible then for families to basically do the funerals themselves with permission? Yes. Is that possible? Absolutely. Has that happened that you know about? Because I saw one in the TV once. <laughs> it, it, it does happen. You know, people, people do look after funerals themselves as a family. Um, I think the reality is that when faced with the rawness of a bereavement, a family with the best of intentions may want to do so, but they may engage a funeral director to, to carry out um, some part of that service, and they may carry out other parts of the service. You know, we we have we have families who may want to use the, the chap's pickup truck for the coffin to travel on, as opposed to using a hearse. You know, but we'll still look after other aspects um, of of the funeral service. So. You know, a family can have as much or as little involvement as, as they would want to do so in a funeral. I think the, the thing to remember is that there is there is ultimately an unpleasant side to death. Um, as funeral directors, very often we would act as the cushion between the reality of death itself and the bereaved family. And because of some of the unpleasant sides that come associated with that, that may then prevent a family from looking after the funeral that they would have hoped to, to look after themselves. I think one of the biggest things is the, the, the care of the deceased themselves. I think that would be quite hard for a family to deal with. Um, but I think all of the committee I mean, are concerned about rising costs for funerals and for families. So we're dealing with people who might qualify for a small benefit that won't, won't cover their costs. And there'd still be um, families that are, have a low income that won't qualify, and three and a half thousand pounds, or even if fifteen hundred pounds is a lot of money to find. Um, in your view, should there be some exploration of other options? I mean, I don't know if such a thing if funeral loans exist, or whether credit unions yeah. provide it. That that yeah. that yeah. Yeah. Right. And there's certain charities, uh, uh, certain multinational. Companies, uh, EDF, of provisions for uh, applications for uh, contributions towards costs of funerals. That's helpful. Thank you very much. Um, if I could just, Mr. Stevenson, you mentioned the cost. I think it's North Ayrshire yes. in your area, and the increase in costs. Um, 30% for one type of plot and 103% for another. Um, can, can we get an idea about what the picture is across Scotland, um, what the variation is across local authorities in terms of costings in these it's areas? Quite, it's quite, they're all not a huge difference between most of them. I, and they seem to have taken the, the attitude of, we'll come to the average, so the average increases. Mm -hmm. uh, there are figures. There are figures here across the board. I, from Aberdeen, 1,400. I, Angus, 1,200. Fife, 1,700. You know, they're, they're not far away from each other. If I take my, my own trading area, which would be Falkirk, it would, it would be £592 to purchase a layer in the cemetery, a further £537 to open the layer for the burial. Um, through our office in, in Bowness, we would often look after the bereaved in South Queen's Ferry. That comes under the City of Edinburgh Council. The cost there is £1,307 to purchase the layer alone and a further £1,150 to open the layer. And I think what we need to remember here is that whilst the £700 has been capped since 2003, the DWP have always paid the local authority charges and it gives you an idea of the variation between them. A bereaved family 
can go to a funeral director, they can discuss the cost with the funeral director, and if they're not able to to um, pay for the funeral and they want to go to another funeral director and try and find costs elsewhere, well, it's a commercial market. You know, funeral directors set, set their charges at what they believe are right and fair for the service that they provide. There are varying levels of service, um, varying levels of investment by funeral directors in their businesses. Not all funeral directors would have the, the same facilities and be able to offer the same services, but I believe don't have choice over the crematoria they would want to use, for instance. You know, Scotland's a very, very big country. If, if we think about the bereaved dying in the northwest of Scotland, well, the reality is that their nearest crematoria is in Inverness, and they may face a two- or a three-hour drive to go to the crematorium. Ultimately, that's impacting upon the funeral director's involvement as well, because suddenly there's an additional five or six hours on top of that funeral was I looking after that in my local area, where I would average a 25-30 minute journey to the crematorium. I, I ask North Ayrshire Council come up with a form, an indemnity form, and as much as we, we would act as the family's agent, but send the invoice direct to the family. They've come back to me and they said they would have to be paid up front for the layer and the opening of the layer. So they're taking no risk whatsoever, and the risk is still remains with the funeral director, and which they would be asking the very people that can't afford to pay up front, they're waiting in the DWP money coming in. And it doesn't affect them because it's not capped and that will go on to the £700 anyway. But now North Asia Council are going to ask for that money up front. I should, I should also add, just as a, another um, example, you know, I, I had a, a lady who was arranging her brother's funeral within... So, our sorry, can I just pause? I think we've got a problem with the yeah, sorry, broadcasting. So Oh, sorry, if we could just wait for the system to reboot. Yeah. We'll start again, do we? Just suspend for a couple of
uh, welcome back and apologies for that brief suspension due to technical difficulties. Mm. Um, I, th I think, Mr Stevenson, you were just finishing off. Is there anything else you want to add to what we were discussing at oh, that point? Thanks, that point. Um, are there uh, any further questions? Yeah, Ms McNeil. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was really surprised to hear that the variation uh, across local authorities of fees, I mean, that is staggering. And and therefore, I wonder if you'd be able to <coughs> offer any views as to whether or not that actually reflects the cost. Um, I mean, it seems to me that I could understand why there'd be variation in transport costs, but I have difficulty understanding why there'd be such a wide variation across local authorities of digging out a layer from 500 to 1,000. And I would be interested in your view on that, whether it actually reflects the costs, because it doesn't sound like it does. I think perhaps you need to ask the local authority that right. question. Certainly North Ayrshire Council say they're on a deficit of £950,000 a year. A deficit for? The bereavement services. Right. There are varying levels of service from local authorities. There are some cemeteries where we go and we would expect there to be two cemetery staff and we would have additional staff with us because there would always be four people normally to, to carry a coffin. There are some cemeteries we go where there would be four cemetery staff and our staff wouldn't be allowed to handle the coffin at all for health and safety reasons. So that, that varies. Um, within my area, if I, if I arrange a cremation for someone within the Falkirk area, the cost for the cremation is £669. If I arrange a cremation for someone who resided in Stirling, they don't have their own crematorium in Stirling at present, uh, the cost rises to £920 as a higher charge because the person's a non-resident. The, the same with regards to burial. I said it was £592 to dig a grave. If the person's not from the area, the cost rises to £867. Um, so there, there are differences in that. Often local authorities look at that differently as well. But the, the trouble is not all local authorities have their own crematorium. Most would have their own cemetery. Um, but a family. It seems to me to be a bit unjust just because you didn't live in that local authority and there's no crematorium, so you have to go elsewhere, so the costs go up. Mm. Um, do you think it, well, you can offer a view if you want. It just seems to me that if there's a desire, and I think there should be, to try and allow families, or low income families, particularly those who don't qualify for the benefit, to try and you know, do a dignified funeral within £1,500. We've really got to, I suppose, I hope the committee will start to look at this, but we've really got to get some transparency in the costs of local authorities then so we can see where there might be ways in which those costs have to come down. If we don't get those costs down, I don't really see how we could really begin to build a, a plan for around £1,500 for a basic funeral. With all due respect, that's the, the funeral director's side. Right. The, the, the local authority side, the crematorium side, is not capped and will be paid anyway. Right. So it doesn't affect the family? Yes, for those who qualify for the funeral benefit. Yep. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. affect them? Yes, but there's going to be lots of low-income families who will not qualify for this. That, that's, that's probably the, the saddest group in as much as, you know, they're in low income, but they're not in any benefits, and, and maybe get five purses with the utilities in each purse and the savings for Christmas, but wouldn't qualify for a benefit at all for the funeral. And, and that, that is a, the hardest group. I Thank think, you. Yeah, yeah Ms. Farrell, yeah. One of the things we haven't mentioned is a change in the um, funeral industry generally, which has been an increase in what's called direct cremation. Um, and this is arising partly for the very reasons that Ms McNeil's talking about. Um, and direct cremation is where the, the deceased is collected by a funeral director from the place of death, taken into care and then taken to a crematorium of the funeral director's choice at a time that suits the funeral director, um, normally with no family present for the, for the funeral. So it's more of a, if you like, a disposal service than a funeral. And it's then up to the family to arrange whatever memorial event they want in their own time, in their own place. And that may be as simple as saying, family and friends, please meet in the pub on Saturday night and we'll all drink his health. <coughs> or it may be that they arrange a full memorial service in a local church. Um, now, that kind of service is becoming 
more, it's not becoming common, but it's becoming more common, um, and both the two national, um, large national companies, <coughs> excuse me, funeral director companies, Dignity and the Co-op, both now offer a direct cremation service, which is a to for a total of under £1,500, including the, the dispersals. You can purchase that service within Scotland for less than £1,000. While that is you know, good news in one sense, it is sad if people, because of their lack of resources, are forced into having what they may not see as a proper funeral. Um, and I think that would be un unfortunate. But it is a, a growing trend w within the industry. I would, I, would, I would agree with what I would agree with um, John's comments. Certainly, as a, as a business, we implemented the direct cremation. Our local authority have just implemented an unattended cremation slot, which I've, I've just checked, and that, that cost is three hundred and thirty-four pounds for the cremation compared to the six hundred and sixty-nine pounds. That time slot that they have available is eight thirty or eight forty-five in the morning, but no one can attend that other than the funeral director and the crematoria staff and I know other local authorities are, are doing that and, and there are instances where people choose not to have a, a funeral they would ask the funeral director just to take care of the cremation the ashes would be returned to the client and they would go ahead and have a memorial service or, or some form of celebration of the person's life and um, but equally that's not what culture is in Scotland and you're, there's then concern from the bereaved charities that there's not the opportunity for people to come together formally as they do and to support one another at a funeral service and there's ongoing concerns thereafter that that could impact upon the grief process. Hopefully, and we offer direct cremation as well, but we, we don't want to take the choice away from the family of a traditional standard funeral. It is another option, but I wouldn't like the families having to take that option because of the lack of resources. Well made. I think, um, Ms. Quality. Yes, thank you. I, I just want to visit very briefly the application process um, by which you get the, the grant, the funeral grant. Um, it seems to me, and in, in, in part of your submissions, that there's an argument that if you are on benefits, qualifying benefits, and we have a, a good hierarchy of relationships, then actually part of your benefit award should state that you're entitled to ex-funeral um, expenses in the event of a death within that hierarchy of needs. I take it that doesn't happen at the moment, but if it did happen, it wouldn't need to be an unknown quantity in an application process because it would already be granted by dint of the fact that you got the benefits. Has that been discussed at all? It's also means tested, though. But your benefits are already means tested. Yeah. But the, the, the funeral benefits is slightly different, means tested. And if there's any insurance policies on death as well. But that, could, is there any way that, that would affect be built? That would affect the benefit. Yeah, but is there any way that can be built in that sort of is made clear at the time well, of it, application? It, it, it's means tested at the time of death, the time of claim. Mm. Which, which, if it was on the, I'm, I'm just trying to think laterally here, if it was on the form, you will get. However, at the time of death, if, if your, your, your mother had a £1,000 in savings, it would affect the benefit. Yeah, I, think, I think perhaps what, 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 well, just to echo what Paul's saying, I mean, we, we would find that we can have a family receiving assistance towards the cost of a funeral, and it can be as, as low as £103 that they receive. But on average, it would probably end up just around about £1,000, £1,004 yeah. is, is, is what we find. But there are a lot of other factors that influence how much assistance would be given, whether that person has their own savings, whether there's been contribution already made towards the cost of the funeral, etc. But that, that would certainly be helpful, what, what you're suggesting, yeah, we would welcome that. There was a, um, a request in the, the last consultation process for the government to include some kind of ready reckoner or computerised you know, digital system where you could see what you were going to be entitled to. I think the concern about that was that there are so many variables that families might go ahead on the basis of the ready reckoner, um, but that might not actually equate to what they, w they got in, in the final analysis. And, and that's the reason that we didn't do that. Um, but I think the concern 
it's taking us back to the concern about the time delay in getting any clear idea of what benefit somebody is going to achieve. Thank you. Okay, are there any further questions? Mr McPherson, welcome back. Um, I think we covered your question earlier on, but perhaps if, if not, we could maybe write to um, for, for further information. I, th I think Mr Balfour covered it. Right there. Um, is there anything else you want to say just before we, we close this first panel? Anything you wanted to get on record that hasn't been covered by today's questioning? No, um, can I thank you very much for your attendance and also for providing us with the, the, the briefings before today's um, session. And um, I'm just going to briefly suspend while the panels change over. Thank you. Welcome back and we now turn to our second panel of witnesses for today's session and we have Delia Henry, Director of Age Scotland, David McCall, Bereavement Services Manager at Glasgow City Council and Ruth Mendel, Policy Officer at Citizen Advice Scotland. Um, I, I would just like to, to, to open a general question again about the, the flexibilities in, in the proposed new system and whether you think that the the proposed flexibilities are enough to ensure that people who are due to receive this benefit um, will be entitled to it. Um, and if I could go to maybe Ruth first, Mr. Mendel. I think probably just to start to say, you know, we do welcome what appears to be a simple structure, particularly around family members at the same level. I mean, quite frequently we do have people coming to Bureau who are maybe they have either a former partner, you know, there's parents or siblings. And I think particularly on estrangement, it seems like a very positive step forward having the simpler process. And particularly for people when they are very vulnerable and they are dealing with grief, if there is something that's an easier process, that's positive. I think what's really important is making sure that it's very clear to people when they're applying, but also for people like Citizens Advice Bureau who will be providing advice and support at that difficult time. And also making sure that all some of the kinks we've spoken about, you know, about, for example, with friends or neighbours, making sure those sort of things are decided before the benefit goes live. So there's not confusion for people at that very hard time. Um, Ms Henry, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I would endorse that. I think it's absolutely important. We welcome the, the um, approach that has been proposed uh, on, from the government so far. However, clarity is really critical. We have people calling who are very confused with the current system uh, to our uh, helpline. And the clarity for both um, advisors and people um, is critical. I mean, you, it, it's so difficult because we're right, the, our colleague from Citizens Advice, people are extremely distressed. So if we can make it as simple and a human rights approach actually to this, think about people, think about how you would feel in those circumstances. And if you need the support and help, you would want to try and remove those complexities as much as possible. So we welcome the proposals, but to simplify it, and plain language is critical. Thank you. Mr McCall, if you... Thank you very much. Obviously, we are kind of at the end of the process, and my opinions are probably less relevant to this particular subject. However, I think simplification uh, with appropriate robust protections in there is, is key to this. I would suggest, however, from a personal perspective, my concern would be that we're capturing all the people who may be troubled by this issue. And I'm concerned those on lower income may not be in benefits. How are we dealing with that particular gap in the market? Excuse me using the term market, but it seems to me there's a gap there that maybe we need to think about how this can assist these people too. Okay. Um, Mr McPherson, did you want to come in and point you previously? I do have an, a few questions. Um, I, I was quite interested in um, citizens' advice. Scotland in, in your submission around the qualifying benefits perhaps you'd like to elaborate on that point yeah. so I think it comes down to think about the simplification of the system so I th what we're so saying is that UC should be included as a qualifying benefit with no further qualifications and it's about making it clear for individuals also for advisors about eligibility and it's really based on the fact that we believe that in the way the full service universal credit operates, it actually isn't necessary to have the qualification that there should be an award of more than zero pounds, because actually in those circumstances, the claim would be closed. And um, in terms of the residents as well, you raised an interesting point in your submission about people who've temporarily moved to provide care. just wondered if you could give more detail on that. So this is actually something that I believe the Scottish Government have mentioned in the regulations that they are looking at, and that's something that we definitely welcome. So the example we're thinking about is, you know, someone that, due to a loved one being ill, has come up to Scotland, for example, to care for them, and but they won't necessarily know how long they will be there at the end of their their relative's life. So I think it just comes back to our point about making sure that these things are worked out before it does go live so that people aren't struggling at that point to navigate a very complex system. Thank you. I may have some questions later, if you know, but that's okay for just now. I, I think it would be okay if you wanted to ask them. Is anyone else wanting Mr. Balfour? Um, I wonder if I could come back around the issue of... Um, provision of funeral directors that we were talking about earlier, uh, and particularly, perhaps, um, Ruth, you could come and comment on some of your experience from your CB of CAB officers, that where, have you got have heard stories of where families have gone to funeral directors, and the funeral director says, I'm afraid you just don't have enough extra money beyond the 700 for us to do the funeral. Um, and have you heard of experience of that? Um, and do you know what then happened in regard to that? So I would say we haven't seen a huge number of cases. What we generally have is people will come to an advisor and they will say that they don't have money to pay for a funeral. They might not necessarily say the particular reasons. I think one thing that was touched on can be the difficult situation for people when they don't know how much money they're going to get. So, you know, for example, a case where 
someone is not able to apply for the benefit because they haven't been able to pay an upfront deposit to a funeral, so they don't have a funeral date, but they're also, because they're not getting the benefit, that's also stopping them arrange with the funeral director what the date is. So I think, I think some of the stuff actually also comes back to the flexibility that we were talking about. And I think it ties into just generally the uptake of benefits and Citizens Advice Bureau can play a really important role that was touched on about if people become eligible in the time period, but we also actually have cases where people would have been eligible for a qualifying benefit, but they actually didn't know they were eligible. So I think that could really help and support people that are on a low income. But I mean, for us, it's, it's people just struggling. And I mean, an example here was we had uh, someone come into Bureau and she'd lost her son to suicide. And she, she had no money. She wasn't able to pay for an upfront payments for his funeral. And she was extremely distressed because she didn't want him to have a local authority funeral, but she simply didn't have the money to pay for it. So I think funeral directors, as I've mentioned, do really try to work with people when they do come in, but it is about choice and it is about dignity and being able to show respect <coughs> for your loved one. So it is a very hard situation. Do, do you have experience, again, just slightly going beyond our remit, but those who don't get the grant, so we're just income is just slightly over that, so we're not going to get the either the uh, burial or the cremation cost covered. What, have you got experience of people coming in who saying, we've got to pay this whole... 1,500, whatever cost it is for local authority. And again, how, do they, how are they dealing with that? And how flexible are local authorities in regard to, do the payment have to be up front? Or are local authorities at all accommodating to people who are just above that income, but are still financially really struggling? I can talk a little bit about some of the work the Citizens Advice Bureau advisors will do with people when they are struggling. I'll probably defer to David in terms of the local authority question. But I mean, we, we actually have the Scottish Government funded some training for advisors about both planning for funerals, but also about how to pay for a funeral. So a lot of the process that advisor would go through with an individual would be asking about whether looking at if they might qualify for the benefit, which they might not, but also be talking about possibly for a lot of people that may be family and friends that they might be able to help for support, but also has been mentioned previously, so I think there are some charitable grants that may be available, so be helping them and supporting them in terms of looking for that. I should say that some people do get amount of the funeral benefit payment and are still unable to pay for it and are able to afford. I mean, we do see cases where people are having to, for example, put it on a credit card that has zero interest, going to high cost credit, which are not things that we would want to be seeing. I mean, I have also actually, when I was looking over cases, some example of someone going into food poverty. And one of the factors was that they had had to pay for a family funeral and it meant they didn't have money to eat. Yeah, but I just, just want to, to, to remind the committee we're focusing on the guidelines today, but we are doing um, our um, inquiry into in work poverty, which might be something we can add into, um, given the evidence that we've seen in funeral poverty yeah, today. Do you see any way just to ask them, in regard to Glasgow or other local authorities, if, if, if someone comes to you who wants an internment and they're financially struggling, do you have any way of... Do, do you offer the payment up front, or do you offer the funeral director for the payment up front, or is there any way that, that can be paid over a period of time? Uh, we don't often get that approach. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening, we, we really are at the end of the process, and very rarely we know the full circumstances of our, our customers, if you like. So being aware of these circumstances, it's very rarely we come to the bereavement services of the council at any point, they would probably take in as advice, social work, other departments first. I suppose the key is the communication that is between the various departments that assist people and making sure that that awareness comes out that we then can consider what we can do. I have not offered that, not been required to offer that, not been requested of me in, in my years with Gladys City Council or previously my other authorities. 
However, it's something that maybe if folk don't know they can do it, that's why it's not been approached. So I can say, in all honesty, I haven't had that approach uh, 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 since my time with Glen City Council. It's just a cognizant of what you just said around being focused on. It was just to ask whether the um, experience with since Vice Scotland in, in terms of involvement of credit unions and in, in, in provision, but perhaps that's um, not um, on topic. So I'm happy to come back to that at a future date. Well, I don't know if you want to to respond to it. So I mean, I think part of the advice process will be talking to people about where they might want to go for money, and a local credit union could be an option. I think also when people are thinking about planning their funerals, part of that conversation could be a saving product with a credit union. Ms. Johnson. Um, good morning. Um, written evidence suggested that in 2014-15, I think 6,300 um, people in Scotland made applications to the DWP social fund um, for a funeral payment and only 4,300 of those received an award. So that was 2,000 refused rewards, um, which is a lot. You know, we're, we're looking at a third and you can only imagine the, the stress that would have caused at that particular time. Um, so just wondering what you think the Scottish Government can do to ensure that the process is better. Um, that you know, you know, you're speaking earlier about using plain English and making sure that the, the, the language is understandable. Do you think that's part of the issue? How can we best help people understand what they're entitled to and make sure, uh, you know, that it's streamlined and efficient and and that people aren't being disappointed at a really stressful time anyway? Can I comment on that? Um, our figures, we did a, a, a survey last year as part of our Money Matters project, and I know we're not talking about debts and things just now, but, but the figures that we had was only 61% of the applications for DWP funeral expenses, um, people were successful. So that would endorse what you were saying. Now, these are all people, we've got over a thousand older people's groups across Scotland, so that was part of um, the demographics, probably at least 60 plus. So would be the group of people that are most liable to be, not uniquely, but most liable to be affected. And it was very unclear what people were going to qualify for. So obviously they thought they were going to qualify, but only 61% were successful. So clarity in um, the criteria we would recommend is, is important, but also around affordability. And I know we're not touching on that too much today, but people um, in that same study, um, only 35% of people had thought about making for provision for funeral costs. And um, only 38% had actually made a will. So all of that is relevant. You, you heard that comment earlier on from the funeral directors about people being prepared and having um, preparations and thoughts about that. So, so that I suppose people are not thinking or talking about at uh, end of life, it's a certainty which people don't want to face and a very distressing time. So I think it's, it's about preparing for that, but, but I think it's very, very significant that only 61% of people were successful in their applications. I think I definitely agree with everything that you've said. And I think what we really see is it's about people struggling to understand both the criteria and also the application process can be very demanding. And I think particularly when people are very vulnerable and uh, experience grief at the same time, that's very difficult. I think the fact that the application window has been extended from three to six months, I think that's a positive step. I think what's really important is communication when the benefit is communication with individuals, some stuff around plain English, communications with people such as Citizens Life Bureau or people at Age Scotland that will be actually advising these people and supporting them through the process. And I think, you know, just think about a case I've got here, someone who was, try who was refused a funeral payment for her partner's funeral and she'd actually borrowed money from her family and expected she'd be able to pay this back. She put in a very difficult decision and an advisor was trying to support her to contact the Department for Work and Pensions. They were kept waiting for a long time. They were being transferred between distant departments. And what she said was she felt she was given, being given the runaround by this agency and they, she felt they should have been trying to help her while she's going through the grieving process. I think there's something about 
it's about the application process, but it's about treating people with dignity and respect. Mm -hmm. We would have similar case studies. We had a situation to our, our helpline. Fortunately, the person was aware of it and they called. And they had a, a, an individual had taken responsibility for his sister-in-law's funeral and then was told he should not have done that when they made the application because there was another member of the family who, in the hierarchy, that was not in benefits. As it turned out, our advisor spoke to them, spoke to the family. The individual that was suggested that he, could, he should take responsibility qualify for benefits and we advised them that. But can you imagine that situation when you've got a... a, a uh, someone in your family who's close but close to you who's died and you're having to scrabble around with the DWP to try and qualify for this benefit it must be so stressful so if you could we can take that out of the system that can only be a good thing okay yes, Other question sorry. convener um some of the written evidence um, raises concerns about the, the eligibility criteria, particularly for older people. Are, are you as a panel you know, convinced that the, the criteria, that we've got that right, that we won't end up excluding people who should be eligible for assistance? Part is that so what we've said already about kind of making sure that people are on the benefits that they're entitled to and supporting them with that and the take up of benefits. I, I would endorse that. It's a, I, and, and the, the case study that I've just highlighted was that this man who was in the situation of not receiving benefits that would have qualified the family, not just him as an individual, but would qualify the family, they didn't know about it. So, so there's a lack of clarity in eligibility and it compounded in a very brief, a very difficult situation. So it's about the clarity and I think that's one of the things, but it's also, we welcome the fact that the, the criteria has been broadened, but, but we need to get this right for people. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Ms. Valentine, yeah. Can I just pick up, because one of the things you raised in your submission was mixed aged couples. You, you obviously are very concerned around that one. So that's basically the situation, and, and we've touched on this earlier about uh, maybe a, someone in a couple um, is, is still working on a low wage, mm. so doesn't actually qualify for benefits. And I know we're not touching that too much, but it can remove el eligibility and cause great distress. So if that was something that the committees would be considering in the future, we, w we were concerned about that because we've had callers to our helpline who um, people are working longer, particularly mm -hmm. women, and are, are on low wages, and that, that can cause a lot of distress and can remove the eligibility for, for the grant, basically. Mm -hmm. Can, can I come back to something um, Ms M Mendel said um, in relation to universal credit and it being a, a benefit that should be um, used as a qualifying benefit, but you talked about the zero award for universal credit and said that, yeah, I'm just trying to get my head around that because I'm, I'm, my understanding I could very well be wrong about um, people who are self-employed or in zero hours contracts that, that it, sometimes they can have a zero award but still be in the universal credit system um, because the next week or the next month the, the, the earnings could effectively drop to zero? My understanding is that there was a change that was made quite recently and now it is that if you are in a zero award, you, the benefit would close. I'm happy to come back and clarify that, if that would be helpful. That would, that would be really helpful, especially to me. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I'm looking to my colleagues for any further questions. Mr McPherson. Thanks very much, Convener. Panel, um, one of the strongest criticisms of the current system is that questions can be intrusive where the DWP are trying to establish whether it is reasonable that someone take on funeral costs. Um, and family estrangement may be one area where it would be difficult for any system to avoid questions which could be considered intrusive. And I just wondered if you have any thoughts on the Scottish proposals and whether they would avoid intrusive questioning of family relationships, um, particularly where there is a need to depart from the hierarchy of relationships in cases of family uh, estrangement. I think I'd probably start by saying I think it's positive that estrangement is mentioned as a complicated situation, so I think it's about recognising it 
at this point. I think, as I've already said, it's about thinking through some of these complex situations whilst the regulations are being developed so that it's very clear both for advisors but also for the people who are making the decisions. I think having the hierarchy does make it slightly clearer and hopefully slightly easier. But I think it is, again, remembering that people are in a very difficult situation at the time and trying to make it as easy as possible and treating them with respect. I think that's absolutely right. Um, if someone is estranged and um, you're in a situation or a family member or a friend is, is close to an individual, um, it could be massively distressing. So thinking that specific through uh, in terms of the process would be very important, I would suggest, um, given the circumstances of, of the distressed people are are in inevitably because they're bereaved. So I think thinking that through, I don't think it's going to be easy, but I do think it has to be considered and, and welcome the fact that it, it's actually been mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Any further questions? Everybody's quite happy. So I, I'm just going to ask if there's anything that, that we haven't covered. I know you sat in in the first session. If there's anything that ha that we haven't covered today that you wanted to, to bring to the committee's attention today, Ms. Mendel? I think I just wanted to start by just you know, kind of saying that we really do welcome that the Scottish Government has committed to uprating the benefit annually with inflation, the, the fixed, the capped element of it. I think that's really important and it is going to ensure that the gap between what the benefit covers and what a funeral cost is not growing. But I think a lot of what we've heard today is about people that can't afford to pay for a funeral, even when they do get the benefit. And these are people, you know, with very little money. I mean, we see cases, we mentioned high cost credit. I've seen cases where, you know, people selling off a mother's jewellery to pay for a funeral. So these are people in very difficult situations. So I'd probably want to echo what some of the earlier panel was saying, you know, we would like to see that increased. I think, you know, kind of the figure that John Birrell mentioned was slightly over £1,000. But I mean, as I say, it's very important that it's being uprated already. But the point that we're starting at is that since 2003, the other cost element hasn't been increased and the cost of funerals in that time has increased significantly. I, again, would endorse that. I think it's really important that we consider that because 2003 to 2018, and you heard described by the funeral directors this morning, the significant changes um, and the impact of that. So welcome the fact that the government are considering an inflation increase, but, but be cognizant of, the, of the, the evidence you've had this morning. Just on that, I mean, you pointed uh, out to the committee earlier that um, so the might so, so women are working longer. So we've all been involved with campaigning with the WASPy women, for example. And when you said that, it just occurred to me that those women who are working because they have been forced to work longer wouldn't qualify might for any benefit, um, but they might be dealing with a deceased person who has no estate, but they wouldn't qualify for anything. And that's why we put the mixed couple example in, because of, of exactly what you're describing. And, and I know we're not talking about, we're talking about people who qualify for benefits just now, but we are talking about people, and you, you've heard it alluded to all, all day today, or this morning, about people in very low incomes and how tragic that can be. So I think it's worth bearing in mind. So, so, so in view of that, I just wonder if, well, you, know, you can argue for the for a, an uprating or a, from 700 to 1,000. I just wondered maybe it would be fairer to allow a, a wider group of people that sum of money on the basis of that. Because if, if you argued that it should go up to £1,000, it's the same people who have the eligibility that will benefit from that when there's lots of other people who will get nothing, the WASPy women or just for example. That, that's that's a possibility. I mean, what we're talking about today is is the funeral um, benefit. However, you're right, and I think the evidence is pulling that out that people on low incomes are the ones that are really challenged, are often really challenged with this, who don't qualify. There are always lines in in any kind of benefit that people will or won't qualify for. So, thinking around what the implications of that are, 
and and you know citizens' advice. I'm sure get lots of people in those circumstances going along to, uh, on very low incomes who are in very distressed circumstances. So you're right. So widening the eligibility may be something to think about. Um, we would need to have a look more at the evidence around that because we haven't done that as much. But but it is examples of the kind of calls that we get, and I'm sure citizens' advice would be the same. People in very low incomes who just don't qualify, and women would be, fall into that criteria. I certainly would be interested in any information that could show. I mean, on the face of the eligibility criteria, it does look like people who are working may qualify if they've got child tax credit, for example. Mm -hmm. But I mean, but maybe older women wouldn't get child tax credit. But, on what, but the balance looks to me that the eligibility criteria is helping those mainly on benefits. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I wondered if you agreed with that. Well, that's what, what's, that's what it looks like. It and does. On the balance, and that's the eligibility criteria tends to exclude low-paid people. It does. E but you might might just qualify if you're on child tax credit. Yes. Thank you. Okay, and Mr McCall? If I could just refer to the first panel's discussion on the cost of right of burial and, and the burial fee itself. Can the committee please bear in mind the fact that there are a whole lot of factors that affect these costs? Uh, when we sell a right of burial, it's sold for a period of 100 years. We have the duty of care to maintain that for that period of time, including the infrastructure and whatever else. So there's a, a fair amount of, of additional unseen cost attached to the sale of a right of burial. We also need to bear in mind the fact that over Scotland there are a variety of geographical social reasons that, that costs have to vary to accommodate these services. So. I just felt it was appropriate. I could maybe qualify that at this stage. Forgive me if it's not appropriate. No, that's it. That's fine. Thank you very much. Um, are there any final final points? Or can I thank you all for your attendance this morning? And um, uh, it's, it's, it's certainly given us a lot to, to consider going forward in our deliberations. So I'll just suspend um, momentarily to allow the panels to change over. Thank you.
Welcome back. We now move to agenda item three on subordinate legislation and Scottish Government officials have been invited to attend this morning to brief the committee on the Scotland Act 1998 Agency Arrangement Specification Order 2018 and answer any questions that might we might have. Um, the instrument is subject to a negative procedure here and at Westminster and we welcome officials Anne McVie. Deputy Director, Social Security Policy Division, and Colin Brown, Solicitor, Social Security Director, both from the Scottish Government. Uh, I refer members to paper six by the clerks. Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee have drawn this instrument to the attention of the Parliament on the ground that the meaning of Article 2 could be clearer. Um, and I would like to invite um, Anne McVie and Colin Brown to explain the purpose of the in instrument and the procedure to be followed. Okay. The, the, the purpose of the instrument is to allow the Scottish Government and the UK Government to enter into agency arrangements as part of the devolution of existing benefits. Um, th this links to things the committee will be familiar with, which are the safe and secure transition of benefits from UK Government to Scottish Government or to be delivered on a devolved basis. As part of that, the Scottish Government and UK Government will undoubtedly wish to make arrangements where, for transitional periods, benefits remain delivered by the UK Government, and this enables the Government to make those arrangements and allows the Committee to look at that as a proposal and say, yes, we are happy that should happen. Um, I don't think anybody has any difficulty with that as a principle. The, the most immediate need of this will be in relation to carer's allowance, because the arrangements for devolution of responsibilities provide that when the carer's allowance supplement is introduced, the Scottish Government becomes responsible for delivery of carer's allowance. At that point, the Scottish Government will wish to have an arrangement in place for the UK Government to continue to deliver that for a transitional period until the Scottish version that this committee has seen through the bill is developed and ready to be put in place. And then further transition will undoubtedly be arranged between those two. So that is what the order is about. Um, I don't know, does the committee want me to go on to address the Delegated Powers Committee point now, or do you want to discuss that aspect? No, I think it would be helpful if you could cover that now. Yeah. Um, what the Delegated Powers have picked up is an example of things that sometimes happen in these cases where people put the words on the page and the drafter knows what they mean by them, and because they know what they mean by them, they miss that others who aren't looking at them with that background may think they could mean something different. Um, and the committee has asked if the meaning could be clearer, and frankly, it could. Um, it has also said the government should consider whether there's a need to amend the order to address that. And the, the view of the UK government and the Scottish government is it doesn't actually need to be amended to address that. Um, I shall appreciate these things are drafted in a co-production manner between the UK and Scottish governments, a number of people involved in it. Uh, it's about a reference to the end of the period. Uh, wh what the drafter has done is picked up that this is referring to the periods for when executive responsibility of benefits will transfer. In the context of the transitional arrangements regs, which are already in place, there can potentially be four different periods for four types of benefits. And we're talking about disability benefits, industrial injury benefits, severe disablement allowance, and most relevantly, carers allowance. Um, and what the drafter intended was that arrangements could be made when each of those four came at the end of the period for each of those four. By moving the reference into this order, if you don't approach it with that blinker, if you like, then you may wonder if it's ambiguous and could it mean something else. And it could mean one of two things. It's either the period when the first of these benefits becomes a devolved responsibility or it's the period when the last of them becomes. Now, the view of both governments is if a person looked at it that way, they would intuitively think, well, surely it must be the first because that's when you would need these things. Um, and if the person looks at the policy background, it's immediately obvious that's what this is about, is to make it a feasible arrangement when the first of these things happen. Um, in the, it's difficult to see how this would ever end up in a tribunal or a court to be assessed anyway. 
Um, but if it did, the other meaning is quite clearly irrational, doesn't fit with the policy and simply makes no sense. So we think inevitably, whichever of the two it means, both fit what the government's intend to do. It delivers a policy intention and therefore there is no necessity to amend it. Okay, is there anything you want to add? Just maybe just briefly, just to go back to the basic purpose of the order. I mean, it's, I mean, as, as Colin said, the use of agency agreements is very much part of in the incremental approach to transition um, that we're taking in line with the Audit Scotland recommendation to make sure that people that are already in receipt of carers allowance continue to receive their benefit week in and week out <coughs> until the, the new agency is in a position to take on delivery of that at its, its own hand. Um, and also in relation to the carers allowance supplement, the use of the agency agreement um, enables us to actually deliver the supplement at, uh, earlier than otherwise would have been the case because we would have had to wait until we were in a position to take on responsibility for carers allowance in the, in the round whereas the use of this agency agreement allows us to deliver the supplement by the end of this summer. Thank you. Are there any questions from members? No, can I thank you both for your attendance and I'll just um, pause briefly to allow you to leave. Thank you. Now move to agenda item four, which is consideration of subordinate legislation, and the committee is invited to note the Scotland Act 1998 Agency Arrangement Specification Order 2018. Um, do the committee note that order? Sure. Yes. Thank you very much. And um, we now move into private session. <laughs>